And we're back. We're live on a given Tuesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And the handsome young man is Adam Cat. Hi, Adam. Hi, Jay. You join us from Denver to talk about your book that you wrote, Life on the Grocery Line. This is an unusual book, it's, and it's very autobiographical. And uh, my guess is that it's available for sale on Amazon. Am I right? Yep. It's on Amazon.com. All right. So um, you wrote this about your own life. So before we get to the book, let's talk about your life. What were you doing that made you write this book? Well, um, so in 2019, I decided to take a, a break from corporate life. I was in a bad situation and I wanted to take some time off. So I, I quit in about, I think it was August or September of 2019 and cashed out my 401k, took a few paychecks and wrote out the rest of the year to work on a, a novel that I've always wanted to write. It's something that I am passionate about writing. It's a big thing in my life. So I kind of wanted to just take that break and enjoy some time off. And so it came to the end of 2019 and I was pretty broke, um, like had some money, but I needed more. So I started working at a grocery store. So it could be like a mental, mental break, but like a physical, like you might be physically busy, but um, so that was in January of 2020. And then by, I mean, by March of 2020, everything changed, you know, like it was, I think it was March 15th, the weekend of St. Patty's day that schools closed and businesses started to shut down. And um, like my job went from just kind of casual fun. I thought of it as fun anyway, that like I would, you know, joke around with people and just check them out, you know, check out groceries and hang out. And it turned into something else. I became like a therapist sometimes. Uh, there was plexiglass and masks overnight. So all of a sudden, all the, the fun of communicating with people went away and it turned into a very isolating and confusing job. There were so many people so upset and scared and they'd still confide in you. Uh, so I decided to start writing all the stories down on a blog called lifeonthegroceryline.com. And over time, I collected those stories over the, the course of the summer and into the uh, well, all the way into this year and um, put, put them into a narrative and created a book called Life on the Grocery Line, Frontline Experience in a Global Pandemic. Mm. So it's almost real time because you were writing a blog, almost real time, and then you put them the blog stories in a book, and now you have a book that's not only biographical, but current at the moment of the story. Anyway. Yeah, uh, it was it was definitely happening in real time. It was a really interesting, and I... I turn it into a narrative that's more fictionalized because that's the easiest way to explain the story and to uh, present the needs that are present the narrative and the, the things that were going on at the time. But yeah, it really resembles my life and other people that I worked with. Well, I want to get into that. But before I do, my question is, why did you a write the blog and, and B take the blog and make it into a book? Why did you do? Why did you feel the need to go public on this? Well, you know, writing is my, it's my passion. It's what I always, or what I wanted to do the last 10 years. And I finally- Did you go to school for it? Um, I went to school for communication. So I just went to college because that's what I was supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> like it wasn't really, I wasn't a writer then, but I um, began to pick that up as I went through college. I think like I, it was the best way for me to work through the stress and the uncertainty of the times. And to share it publicly is my hope that other people would connect. Like, I know that when someone uh, writes something that I connect with, it makes me feel easier in the world. It relieves anxiety in a way that someone relates to you that you may never know. And that blog really turned into a community of sorts. People were sharing stories with me, um, telling me, like, about their fears and anxieties about their family members that worked in the industry. And I like, you know, it, it helped bring about a community and it helped bring happiness to certain people. And that like, that made me think that, you know, maybe I should make this into a bigger story. I should tell the story about this time because it's a unprecedented in, a, you know, world history, really, you didn't expect this to happen. So it, it definitely, um, it needed the story. People from the uh, that work through the grocery industry during the time deserve to have their story told. 
So I thought maybe since I'm I'm living through this and I got nowhere to go, I can't go to another job because there was no one was hiring. There's nothing like that. So I figured I'd turn it into a book and uh, mm-hmm. see where it goes. Well, let, you know, let's let's take a snapshot of say March and the spring anyway of uh, 2020. What was it like in a grocery store? You know, because I mean, people outside of grocery stores were wondering whether mm, there would be food on the shelves, mm-hmm. one, wondering whether the supply lines would would hold up. Uh, and of course, the people in the store were, you know, you, you say that um, they they the customers talk to you sort of like a bartender, right? Uh, tell you their stories because they feel, you know, that you you listen to them. At the same time, I recall incidents where customers would harass people in the grocery store, um, would act out uh, against people and uh, other customers. So can you describe for us the environment that existed, at least in your grocery store, in the spring of 2020? Yeah, so it, it like... I mean, the shelves started to get empty right away, right? So rice, toilet paper, for some odd reason, right? All and paper towels were all gone, but canned food, frozen goods. It was so bare and dystopian looking, like even the individual drinks were gone. And um, I worked at a high-end grocery store. I won't say the name, but like the, it was definitely, you know, in a very affluent neighborhood. So I had that kind of clientele too, who expected certain things out of their local grocery store. And um, it was intense because I thought I feel like a lot of people didn't ha- like they never really had dealt with their life in a real way, like having their kids stay home with them and they have to all of a sudden take care of them all day and they have to teach them online and or help them teach, like go through their homework and do all these different stresses. And it it was so intense. It was like for a while and some people were really nice. But, yeah, we had a fair amount that would like flip out or start crying. Um, one lady in particular, I remember. So she, we, I was checking her out and we were running out of bags along with everything else because we were so busy. And she asked me if she could double bag or if I could double bag her groceries. And I told her we can't because we weren't supposed to at the time. Well, I knew immediately that that wasn't going to go well because you could see it. She started grabbing things off the conveyor belt. She grabbed the bag out of my hands, ripped it out of my hands, and she was throwing her groceries into the the cart. And she even missed some on the floor. And as she's storming out, she like I'm, I'm watching her do this thing, and like kind of in awe or shock. And she stops at the last cash register, licks her hand, lifts it up towards the sky, says something to me, and smacks it down on the counter. And I knew right then that like people were so close to, to breaking. Some people were. That was in May, I believe, that that happened, April or May. And it all came home in a very real way. I remember I had to take a break. And I, like the, I mean, at the time, you almost thought, like, is that like a biohazard or something like that? It, it, was, it was sketch. And everyone was at the breaking point. And you just kind of, as a grocery store employee, you just kind of had to take it and keep going. Mm. Yeah, I must. Have, did you lose staff in that period? And people say, I, I, I don't want to come in here. I don't want to deal with this. Uh, I don't want to deal with um, customers that are losing it. I don't want to deal with the risk of getting COVID myself. You know, we, it wasn't that we lost staff, but they had a they have an attendance policy that you can only miss a few days. Well, they got rid of the, the attendance policy for a while. So a lot of people would call in and that would um, that would definitely short staff us all the time. We were extremely short staffed, like on top of everything else, we didn't have enough people because, you know, it, I understand it's stressful and you needed extra days off or um, so, yeah, it piled on. But we I think everyone stuck like stayed with it because there weren't many other jobs out there. So mm. and there wasn't much money for some people. I mean, the disadvantage, I don't know if you're high end store service the disadvantage, but, uh, you know, if I don't have any money. That's going to reflect on on the food I buy. Um, did you see that happen? Did you see a, a trailing off of business? Did you see um, credit situations where they weren't able able to pay? No, my store specifically, I didn't see anything like that. Um, it's definitely the nicest neighborhood in, or not the nicest, but maybe the ritziest neighborhood in Denver. And it um, 
if people had carts piled like above the brim so you're talking about like 500 600 worth of groceries and a lot of it was perishables so like you know they buy a bunch of vegetables things like that which only going to last a week it was like hoarding at a pretty scary level and look one of the nice things about working there is that i could get stuff after after hours and like we get it from when we get a new shipment in you could get stuff to just cover you for a week um they they stockpiled a little toilet paper for us so that we could have some um because you couldn't get it anywhere uh i never saw any like uh people missing out but i did see like this this fear in people's eyes you had that kind of look when if you've ever been in a hospital where someone's been all up all night worried about their loved one you saw that like bags in their eyes like intense fear uncertainty all the time and it didn't matter you know rich poor like we we didn't make i didn't make much money you know uh the minimum wage in denver is 15 bucks an hour so that's what i was making and you know we were all it was a great leveling experience in a way you were very much on their level a lot of times and then you know other ones break you or ask for ridiculous things but it was fascinating that way and when you think about it um you know, if people are um, isolated at home, um, they, the only place they really have to go out is, is for food. You know? Otherwise, they stay at home. So you become their life experience outside of the isolation. Um, and this, these are the moments of their life when they're actually interacting with other people. Otherwise, really not. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I like to get a handle on the dynamic uh, and and that means uh, you know from the time it first started in March April May of 2020, uh, you were there what uh, maybe a year after for a year later. Mm -hmm. How did it evolve? <clears throat> How did it change? Did you continue to see the bags under the eyes? Uh, did you continue to see the the outbursts? Um, as the pand pandemic wore on, um, everything just kind of settled back into the strange normal um where like uh, how people were calling us heroes at the beginning um i, I was <laughs> yeah and I, you know like i and i never thought of myself as a hero and i know no one i worked with did it was kind of a running joke inside but um i understand it comes from a good place and i know that people really appreciated us being there and and even more than the food like you said the just the interaction with someone besides like you're just your family or the inside of your walls in your empty apartment, you know, or zoom meetings, which aren't the same thing, you know, just having someone to talk to someone that um, even for a two minute conversation, it went a long ways. And as the, the, the time, like the lockdowns and things wore on, um, I feel like it was more um, the people, it just lost patience quicker. Like it, at first, everyone was real, like, could be really nice at moments and patient with you. But over time, I mean, everyone was so sick of it. And I was tired of having a plexiglass screen, you know, having my um, mask on. So I feel like I'm in a bubble away from everyone. And in no way I can make connections like I would want to. So it, it, that's what I saw the most was just it. It wore on and it wore down everyone. And I was very grateful to get out of that situation and go into yeah. the inside of the store. Yeah, enough is enough. But, um, you know, it, it strikes me that at the beginning, uh, we're all in this together kind of mentality um, that changed somewhere along the line. And it became politicized mm -hmm. and people didn't want to wear masks. And I recall seeing a number of articles in the newspaper about altercations. Uh, where, you know, uh, uh, a retail clerk in some retail establishment would say, you know, you need to wear a mask in here, and the customer would get into an argument or a fight about it. Yeah. And it was really awful to see that. Did you have that experience? Did it happen in your store? Um, yeah, you saw it with, with certain people. I remember um, this one man came in, this older gentleman, and he, like, this was right we hadn't got masks yet, but a lot of people were coming in with it and we hadn't got plexiglass. And he was, he stood as close as he could in the checkout lane, like the self checkout. And he was kind of yelling at me about how my CEO wasn't treating us properly or our company's not taking care of us. And he sat there just breathing heavy on me. 
like everyone knew that this was, or was an airborne virus, but like we were not getting all, we hadn't all the, the um, safety things in check yet. They hadn't been in place. And he just stood so close. And I just remember him like bearing over me, telling me something that I have no control over. And I, it, it made me like think, you know, he's so used to like this, having control in his life that this loss of control, he was like basically um, projecting on me in the, in this moment when he should not be this close. Like, we don't know anything about the virus. We don't know how this works. You should not be breathing all over me and lecturing me about things. And it was, it was startling because like some people just don't see beyond like what's in front of their nose, you know? And uh, yeah, it was, we saw quite a bit of that. I, I eventually just didn't um, really, <laughs> I didn't tell anybody to put on a mask. I wasn't going to do that. I'm not going to, argue with someone or fight over it. So like you just kind of go through the motions and get through your day. Mm. Interesting. Uh, you know, I had an accountant once and you would ask this accountant, what, what do you, what do you do? And he would say, I, I practice uh, psychiatric accounting. And so what does that mean? Well, you know, you have to take every client um, on his own merits and you have to look at this person and understand this person if you're going to do you know, good accounting for them, personal accounting. And um, I guess I would say that um, you know, what you describe is, is a psychiatric uh, retailing, psychiatric, <laughs> psychiatric uh, food selling, so to speak. No, <laughs> you have to look and see who you're dealing with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's so true. Well, you know, during, during this whole continuum, 20 to 21, we had, um, you know, two significant things. Um, one was the Delta, which I guess came after your time. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, uh, you know, Omicron came much more recent than that. You know, people forget, but Omicron is, you know what, it's, it's a month old, maybe six weeks old. That's all it is. And right. yet it has, it has completely occupied our lives. So my question is, uh, I know you're not there anymore, but I wonder if you have a view or, you know, people who you talk with who are there um, to describe how these changes in COVID may have affected the environment, the phenomena that you're talking about in the grocery store. Yeah, the, um, you know, I, I've been on this podcast a few times that called a retail war zone. That so I, I'm pretty connected to a lot of people that still work in there in the industry, and I it it feels like it's kind of forever. It's going to be that way forever, but they also I think like, I know that there's some, um, we have King supers here, which is a Kroger offshoot and they're going on strike or they might go on strike. And I, I think like it, if anything, people are the work in the grocery industry are like seeing their conditions and they want it to be better. So they're, they're mobilizing now it, the, um, whether or not that's successful or if it's beneficial for them, I don't know, but like the, I think it's helping them realize their conditions. And it's, I don't think anything's changed for them. It, it's still just as intense and just grinds on and on. And it, it's already a hard enough day. I was in, my store was so busy. Like we'd, I'd see a thousand customers on a really busy day, you know, just through my line. And you're on your feet the whole day. You know, you're taking care of people, their problems, their leaky bags of whatever that they hand you, the, the dismissive attitudes. Um, there's a lot of things that were there beforehand that COVID only magnified. And now you have two years running of this, that it's, it's got to be brutal on them. Um, mm -hmm. And Retail Warzone does a good job of like highlighting their day-to-day -day struggles that they go through and thinking about mobilization and stuff like that. Yeah, well, that's, that leads to a question I was going to ask you. Um, you know, the grocery industry changed, and um, some of those changes are permanent. Uh, the retail industry has changed, and some of those changes are permanent. And I wonder if you can speak to that, because, you know, we're not out of this yet. And, and the, frankly, um, you know, we're not going to be out of it for a while. And when we get out of it, it'll be, it'll be no better than an endemic, right? It'll be sort of an ongoing ongoing infection. 
Um, mm -hmm. So the question is, how, how does all that, you think, in the long term, affect the industry? Well, in the very long term, I can see it definitely affecting the supply chain. And we've, we're already seeing the supply chain issues like globally as a result. I work, I work in supply chain now. I work for a big consumer packaged goods company. And, you know, our orders are, we're, we're filling it less than 50% on a lot of stuff. Then that's going to big organizations. Like we, we feed into Kroger and places like that. So you, you see those empty shelves and the word around like industry, talking to my manager, talking to my director is that we're going to have to expect that for, you know, the next four or five years that it's going to slowly get back. And hopefully we don't have another major thing that goes wrong. Um, hopefully I'm optimistic that it comes back sooner, but those empty, those empty shelves and not having what you want is always going to affect the customer on the customer level too, that they're going to, you know, be more upset. Things are going to be tighter. There's, I don't know if the mask thing will go away. I don't, I, it's hard to say, to be honest with you. Um, it, it really depends on how far we get along with everything and like government officials and what they decide to do. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that one of those things that will definitely come out of it maybe as awareness of like conditions of retail workers and grocery store workers that they, they strive for better or better try and better their lives and not work at a grocery store forever. Um, I hope those sort of things. And I've seen a lot like grocery industry specifically is very transient. A lot of people don't um, stay there for that long. Well, it's I, probably more transient now than it was before. Nobody, yeah. nobody in the, in the room is going to say, Oh yeah, I want to make a career out of this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's been fading for a long time too. I think I don't, the, um, I know they just kind of constantly short staff you anyway, where I was working, it was always short staffed when I, I worked in the prepared foods department as a manager later. And it was, you know, we were always, we never had enough staff because no one gets paid a great amount of money to just kind of grind it in, grind it out. And I mean, the holidays were kind of cool in a way, cause it's really like a lot of energy, but we were so busy all the time and you beat down for basically minimum wage. So I don't know. The future is, is pretty uncertain, I feel like. Yeah, well, you know, if, if uh, the, the situation continues where people um, limit their their daily activities and they limit leaving their homes, they still have to go to the store and get food. Yep. And um, therefore, it becomes a you know, sort of a central place. And, uh, and the smart retail organization is going to have more staff. They're going to find a way. Uh, to be better staffed and be competitive. And I, and I suggest that, you know, the retail of food in the future is going to be kind of a mecca uh, in, you know, the, the commercial life of the community, because that'll be one of the only things where you have a commercial life in the community. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was kind of a big revelation for me when I, I, I never really thought of a grocery store as that essential to my community in the way that, interactive people were so grateful that we were open um i was grateful that we were open so i could go in and get groceries and and that i had a job and it like before it's just a, a lot of times it's just a place you go in and you leave you know you don't talk to anybody you don't maybe don't even talk to the cashier and one of the things i've been trying to tell people as i've been uh, promoting this book and uh, gaining media is that you know, treating grocery store employees just like they're human. I don't, you don't have to tell them they're heroes. You don't have to, you know, like over chat them up, like, but just that they exist and that, you know, Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it? like smiles, things like that. Even if you can smile only with your eyes because of the mask, <laughs> you know, it goes a long ways. It really does. It makes your life a whole lot better. Well, I want to ask you more about the book. You've been describing, you know, certain situations, which I'm sure, were included in the blog and in the book, but uh, can you think of a couple that were special uh, where, you know, it sticks in your mind that this is really the kind of story you wanted to tell uh, that has a special meaning for you? Yeah. The, you know, uh, so there, like I said, it was a very fluent neighborhood that I was working in. So we, um, there's a brain surgeon that came in and I relate this story into the narrative in the book. Um, he would come in, he had like six or seven kids, I think. And he would come in and he, he ended up in my line like two or three times. And then he came in like four or five, about like four or five or six. And he'd come in like pretty frequently, like every two weeks with 
$700 worth of groceries or 600 bucks. It was a lot. And, you know, he would always talk to me about what's going on in my life. And I told him that I was working on, well, I was working on the blog at the time. And I told him the book story and all that stuff. And he was like, that's amazing. You're writing a book. That's amazing. And I mean, it's coming from a brain surgeon. There's probably like 10 of them in Colorado and there's, you know, a few hundred in the country, I would say. And but he was, he was fully engrossed in like talking to me about life and about all these other things. And, you know, it takes a while to check out, you know, a huge cart of groceries. So we had like 10 minutes together on a pretty regular basis. And I just, I thought that was so impressive. It made me like reassured of humans a little bit. When you start to get downtrodden, you get lucky. And he was like, didn't have to take the time. He was like an elite person, very elite in so many ways, but he was more interested in my life and my coworkers' lives than, um, you know, he was about his own stuff. So it was it was really nice. And I, it, it will always stick with me for sure. Yeah. So the other side of the equation, you mentioned about how people, um, you know, should be kind and reasonable to retail clerks and the like, but it changes people. If they are, if they recognize what you're saying, it changes people. It changes the way they, they deal with the world. Um, query whether the brain surgeon would have been exactly like that before COVID, uh, right. you know, maybe, right. maybe it's a special feature of COVID. The other thing I was going to ask you, Adam, is, is uh, what about the, your prose? I'm so curious about your prose because you are a writer, and and I can tell from talking to you that you're a writer, by the way. No. <laughs> so so if you have the book handy, I hope you do, um, yeah, could you just turn to a page that you like and give us a paragraph of it so we oh. can val- we can you know examine your prose? Sure. Oh, man. I'll just start from the beginning. Okay. It's my second day at work. The pace is starting to pick up. From the express lane, I look over the aisles and islands filled with food and patrons. The grocery store is a lightning rod of energy and commotion where the world ends and begins in spectacularly mundane fashion. Children are running from their mothers and fathers. In every direction, people are yelling and complaining and laughing. It's controlled chaos, in a sense, held together by invisible norms forged through evolution and social conditioning. I absorb this curious institution or curious and lively institution of Americana with accidental ease, like a toddler learns words, but it's hard to keep up. I walk towards the registers, my head on a swivel, as people come to me with all manner of questions. They see dream grocers prominently displayed in bright orange on my black apron like a beacon to all those hopelessly lost in search of the items they need. Where's your European style braised veal chops with those delicious potatoes? You know, the tiny ones? I look at the woman for a moment with wide eyes. She stares back at me, clearly annoyed. I don't know where her item is located. I'm sorry, I'm new. Here, let me ask my supervisor, Alejandro. I don't, don't worry about it. I'll just look around. Before I can ask for direction, she's gone. Just yesterday in orientation, Alejandro told me that my first few shifts would be a flurry of information and sound. The clientele that at this particular location doesn't have patience and they will assume I know what they want before I I even speak. You know, the thing about it is, uh, I, I feel that um, you, you, you speak of changes, changes uh, in the way the customers react, changes in the way the, the, the clerks react, changes in the way you react, changes in the supply line, in the way the grocery functions. And it doesn't only apply to groceries. It, it really applies to all retail. Just a grocery is such an intense example of retail. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also it also touches you, Adam. You know, you find that uh, you need to express yourself in a blog and then a book. So I guess my you know, running into the ninth inning here, I guess my question to you was, how have you changed because of this experience? Uh, it was not what you expected. Yeah. Um, interesting. How have I changed? Well, I. One thing that I really, re- I realized right 
right after the pandemic hit was that because I, I I figured it uh, figured my job there as an in between job like I had my draft of my first novel I was just gonna do this for a while you know like until I got a full manuscript and I can pitch an agent do all those things and I really. I thought of it as a throwaway kind of situation. And I don't think I ever really looked at it as a vital part of not only the community and everything, but my life. And as a result, and like the daily conversations you'd have with people and the weird like level of bonding that you would, that I grew with um, different like coworkers became good friends. And we had this, like, you're all like, you're it's us against them sort of thing, or like you're in this together but in a, in this, in this together, like much closer to the nerve, it, um, it made me appreciate all the like retail workers, the grocery store workers, the, the uh, forgotten people in many instances, they're forgotten in society. And, um, I hope with the book that people like it connects with them and they can see themselves. It's a dark comedy. I've, I want it to be funny because it should be funny. You need to be able to laugh at yourself and at the world and the absurdity that you live through. And um, I, it makes me laugh. Like I, I'm so, I'm grateful that I, I went through that, even though I wish we didn't all have to go through a pandemic and there's lives lost and there's all this horrible things around you. But like, if you can grow from it and find a reason to go on and to in connection with people. I think that that's, that's what I got out of it. And I hope people do too. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> Did you finish the novel? Is there a, is there another book about, you know, business and commerce in you? Um, well, I have a second book that I'm working on right now, but it's, it's a sequel to this. So it goes into more into the life of, Daniel, who's the protagonist. So I want it to be about everything I loved and hated about working in a grocery store. So the, like the camaraderie you feel like how everyone, it's like almost like high school again in a way, but it was also, um, you know, you're getting paid for it. It was a, yeah, it was definitely like a phenomenal experience, but that's, that's where I want to go next. I want to show the world what it's like in retail and what, what it's worth in our lives, I guess. There's much more to come. There's a lot of material coming. You know, we've had a lot of material, but there's a lot coming, in my opinion, and therefore a lot of content for you to write about, uh, either either in direct fact, or in fiction, uh, or in satire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got to have a sense of humor. Uh, Adam Cat, who has a sense of humor and who wrote this great book called A Frontline Experience, whoops, uh, Life on the Grocery Line. Um, and you can find truth on a grocery line. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you so much, Jay. Appreciate it. Aloha.